Praise, I need local more monitors. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for he is worthy of our praise. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, our Lord is worthy to be praised. Now, y'all gonna give me some more time back on that uh, sermon time thing because the truth of the matter is, I wish I had time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One of my, one of my deacons gave me this on the birthday that just passed, and it is so true that uh, we have the time that God has given us, and we ought to utilize it to its fullest. Um, I, 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 I remembered something that uh, that event that took place in the month of August, and I wasn't able to participate and Deacon Lenny and now the new sister Lenny Watson um, wedding. It was the August the 12th, I believe, right? And it was on my wife's birthday, on first lady's birthday. And I'm just glad to see that y'all still around, still here, amen. Um, <clears throat> These days, people can't last 30 days, let alone 30 years. Um, but praise God for you. Congratulations to you. We have been looking at this issue of discipleship. We also have been looking at discipleship from the perspective recently from the perspective of there are five words that every disciple needs to be acquainted with. They need to know it needs to be ingrained in their memory because of the meaning biblically behind these five words. We dealt with the first word last week and that first word that we looked at was the word justification. We discovered that this is essential to the issue of salvation. It says, or the scriptures convey and share with us that this word justification is what God imputes and God declares that we are. We are justified. Meaning that what Christ has done for us, it has nothing to do what we have done. We cannot do anything to make us justified. God imputing righteousness to our account on the behalf of or because of what Christ has done for us. His death, his burial, his resurrection was validation for those that put faith in him. He will take his righteousness and put it to the account of our unrighteousness that will nullify our previous state of being unrighteous because of his own righteousness. He gives it to us. We receive it by faith in what Christ has done 
for us. He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him, Jesus Christ. What a phenomenal, profound truth that God, in spite of you and I, he has placed his righteousness to our account that was full of unrighteousness, that met the very standard that God required to be accepted in his family. We are saved by faith through grace, and as a result of that, Christ's righteousness was put to our account as if we had never sinned. That is called, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's definitely praiseworthy. No one that comes to Christ comes because they deserve it. No one that approaches God to be accepted in his family because we have earned it. No, God in his abundance of mercy and grace looked beyond, as the songwriter said, our faults and saw our need. He gave us what we did not have so that he may make us into what we previously were not. That is righteous in his sight. This issue about justification, um, we need to be passionate and zealous about sharing with others because this is the best deal in town. That you can come to a holy and righteous God and he does not put on you what you have done but he puts on you what his son has done and you and I receive it by faith because Christ did it. And God wipes your slate clean as if you had never sinned. That's the best deal in town, my sisters and my brothers. And here's the other uh, uh, truth about justification. Is that once you are justified, declared righteous, you can, I, I can, you can not do anything to make you more righteous in his sight. Because it's not dependent on you and I, it's dependent on what Christ has done. And here it is, my sisters and my brothers, that will never change. That will always remain the same because it has nothing to do with you and me or has nothing to do with the part that we play between you and me. It is by grace through faith that he declares us righteous, justified. The theologians call that that is your position in Christ. When you read through the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters, it speaks about our position in Christ spiritually. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God sees us in heaven already. And if God sees us in heaven already, there is nothing that anyone can do to disqualify us or unjustify us to put us out of heaven. That is our position in Christ. But the word that we want to look at that every disciple needs to be acquainted with this week is the word called sanct 
sanctification. The doctrine of justification establishes our position in Christ. But the doctrine and teaching of sanctification establishes our practice in Christ. The doctrine of justification says to you and I what our standing is in Christ. But sanctification works with our present state in Christ. Our position in Christ can never be nullified, but our condition via sanctification can be up one day and down the next day. But the reason why I, we have been identified with Christ in our position is because God wants our position to affect our condition down here on earth so that we would mirror what we are spiritually. He used this sanctification as the process so that we can mirror it physically. So we are to mirror what we are in our identity, our identity with Christ. He, by his spirit, uses this process of sanctification to help us be conformed into the image of Christ on earth until we will be just like Christ in the state of glorification which is the end of it all so this word this teaching this doctrine of sanctification I believe is one of the most misunderstood doctrines between the three between justification and glorification, I think sanctification is often misunderstood on what that means. For there are different views in Christendom that teaches us different things about sanctification. I was shocked in my study this week and last week, primarily this week, in discovering that some people really believe, certain groups in Christendom believe that sanctification is what God does by improving our unregenerate nature. And in improving our unregenerate nature or our old nature to the point that we can get to a point that we completely organically, pragmatically, we can grow to a point that we never sin again. Now, as much as hilaria that that may bring to you, which says to me, you know better, um, John Wesley held that position, that you can get to a point on earth that where you don't sin no more. I even heard a modern-day teacher teach that by the name of Joyce Myers, she even taught that in one of her gatherings that she believes that she is even getting to a point where she does not sin anymore. That, that, that's a view of one of the views in Christendom that says that you don't, I don't, we don't, sin no more. Another view in Christendom about sanctification propagates 
that sanctification is a different experience than salvation. Meaning that you are saved, but you don't have to be sanctified. The truth of the matter is, if you are not sanctified, you are not saved. And I used to remember, um, even when I was coming up in the faith, when I got converted back in um, 1974, I remember that the church community and certain groups in Christendom that were part of the church community used to say that I'm saved and sanctified. Come on, y'all not talking back to me. Some of y'all remember that. You don't even, I don't even hear that no more. That is not even a common nomenclature in the body of Christ. And it is oftentimes limited to a specific group. It used to come off like I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, fire baptized, running the sea with the end going to be like. I wish I had some believers that grew up in that era as if sanctified believers was a separate set of believers that was different than other believers. But the truth of the matter is the Bible does not teach that. What the Bible does teach, and I hope you will walk with me through this this morning, the truth of what the Bible teaches about this matter of sanctification and being sanctified is that sanctification is a normal experience for every Christian. It's not a set-aside experience for certain Christians. There's even a group in Christendom that believes that when you get to the point of being so spiritual, they will call you and elevate you to be a saint. And you can also, as you get to that elevation of sainthood, you can also be used by God and they immortalize you. And you can be used by God to be a conduit of healing for those that are on earth so they can petition you for certain things. Because you have been elevated to the sphere of sainthood. The truth of what the scriptures teach is that every Christian is sanctified. And every Christian is called a saint. Because we are a set-aside group of people that God chooses to use for a particular use. My sisters and my brothers, I think this concept is real um, easy to grasp because this concept is practiced even in your own home. Meaning this, that probably most of you, maybe I'm being presumptuous, but there are certain plates in China and, and, and knives and forks and silverware and utensils that you do not use every day. They are set aside for a specific reason and for a specific time. Uh, Maybe I'm, I grew up in an era that where my mama bought some china and some silverware 
that was sterling silver because every now and then we would sit around the table and she would get that silverware cleaning and we would have to shine the silverware because of the tarnish. It, it, can anybody here help me? Uh, uh, of the tarnish that got on it. That set of silverware was set aside for special use. That's what sanctification is, is that God has set aside all of those who have experienced salvation has been justified by justification on what Christ has done and now he has set aside saints which means interpreted from the Greek holy ones separated ones and this issue of sanctification is twofold it is both set aside from something to something you better wake up and write that one down. It is set aside. Sanctification means being set aside from something to something. And so the scriptures share with us this issue of sanctification is not a separate uh, experience from salvation. No, they happen simultaneously. The minute that you and I are saved, we are also sanctified, set apart from what we used to be and what we used to do to him in whom we are now going to serve. I know this ain't a preachery kind of presentation, but this kind of presentation don't need to be preachery yet. It, we need to get the truth of the matter. We need to be taught something before we celebrate the something that we are being taught. So, again, this issue about sanctification is a twofold or two sided truth that says that. We are sanctified from so that we can be sanctified to. Now, my sisters and my brothers, sanctification has nothing to influence justification. That is what it is. That's been done, solidified, verified, certified by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. God did that for us, but what he wants to do is sanctify us, and that's what God does in us on earth so that we can mirror what we are spiritually in heaven. One talks about our position. Sanctification talks about our condition. One talks about our standing. Sanctification deals with our state. So what God does is that he desires to, wants us to, need to, we need to look like the one that has done something for us. We need to mirror what they can't see. But we know what we are because of our standing in Christ. So let me move from the technical aspect of this word sanctification to the pragmatic aspect of this issue of sanctification. So I have one that I did share with you that this issue of sanctification comes by, it's a positional truth, but then it is also, here is his key word, a progressive truth. 
It's a positional truth, and it's a progression, progression, progressive truth. Now, 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 quickly, if you would, and the clock said I had 10 minutes, but no, y'all took some of my time as soon as I stood up. So you're going to ask some more time to that, or freeze it for right now. <laughs> no, but, uh, and, and again, this is so majorly important for every disciple to get this concept, this truth, this doctrine of sanctification that um, it, it's so crucial and so vital that I got to slow down a little bit because I do wish I had some time. Uh, my sisters and my brothers, please understand that this truth is not only positional, it's also progressive. And what I mean by progressive is that it does not come in completion on earth. It is a truth that the Bible teaches that not only he does something in us, but we play a part in it. On him doing something in us. I want you to turn with me to a few passages and one of the passages that I want you to turn with me to is the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, you don't have to stand. Verse 15 is so important that we understand that the sanctification process is what we participate in as well. What did I say? 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, I think it's 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Nope. Okay, let, let me look back at First Peter. Now, this is embarrassing. Preachers don't ever do this. Peter says in First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, starting, well, verse 14 also says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear the threats and do not be frightened. But in your own hearts, sanctify Christ our Lord. The NIV version says, in your own heart, hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. King James Version said, the hope that lies within you. Notice what he says. Sanctify Christ as Lord. You, me, us, sanctify Christ as Lord in your own hearts. You know how we have this rote, repetitious testimony that you hear. I know quite frequently if you've been around church any length of time. Giving on to God, who's first in my life. Well, here Peter says, that should be a normality. That should be normal that Christ is revered and sanctified in your own heart. That Jesus is Lord. This sanctification process has joint participation between you and I and the Spirit of God and the Word of God, which says that it is a progressive truth that we progressively and continually deal with the issue of us being sanctified pragmatically. 
meaning my sisters and my brothers, if you just walk with me for a few more minutes, meaning that this progressive side of this two-side truth is not only positional, but it's progressive and practical, and that is this. We are not what we are positionally. Sanctification helps us to become that practically. So that you and I will look like, act like less of us and more of him. The late preacher, teacher, Timothy Ruffin says, the issue with sanctification helps us to understand that we don't go to bed a blunder and wake up a wonder. You don't overnight totally change. And what you used to do, you don't do no more. And this happened overnight, the same day that you accepted Christ. When you wake up, go to sleep and wake up, you are entirely new. And you don't do any of that stuff no more. That's contrary to the biblical blueprint. Let me show you, validate, confirm to you that truth is a misnomer and that truth is a misnomer from the perspective that you don't sin no more since you have accepted Christ. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 7. We're probably going to lock and load here and close out here. Now we must understand that in the book of Romans chapter 7, Paul has already gone through what got us to chapter 7. In his phenomenal theological dissertation, he starts out in the book of Romans chapters 1 and 2 and 3. He talks about us, all of us, every one of us are condemned before God. He says there is none righteous, no not one, all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. We are all sinful sinners. We do what is contrary. We are naughty by nature. It's in us to do that which is contrary to the will of God against the word of God transgressioning against God's moral law, literally being in rebellion against God. What God says is wrong, we say it's right. And what God says is right, we said it was wrong. It was our nature to do that. And because of that, that causes God to condemn us. But in every courtroom, you are appointed an attorney, and that attorney is to represent you. And in God's courtroom in heaven, he not only is the judge, but he will appoint you an attorney to defend you. And his name is Jesus. Let me tell you how bad he is on his representation. His name is big and large. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 says, you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin. His name is so big and so bad. Acts chapter 4 where Peter says, there is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. Paul says, let me throw in and tell you how awesome of an attorney he is, a public defender he is. Paul says, for God has given him a name that's above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow in earth, under the earth, and in heaven. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If I was you, I would let him represent you in the courthouse of God. He can. He will. He's got 
whole lot of clients to prove that he can move you from condemnation to justification. And Paul says in chapter 4, we have been justified by faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, he says we have benefits for being justified. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have access to his presence. God ain't mad at us. And verse number 9 said we're saved from the wrath to come. Because we have but faith in Christ, Christ has justified us, given us benefits for being justified. And somebody may ask the question, well, I've been justified, and I didn't do nothing to get justified. I couldn't do nothing to make me more justified. So that means I can do whatever I want to do since I've been justified. Romans chapter 6 says, how be it? God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live in sin any longer? What know ye not that you are crucified with Christ? Don't you know that God has taken you through the process of being crucified so that you may be raised with Christ so that you may not do the stuff you used to do? Romans chapter 7 says, that's good, that's great, so I can do what I need to do, but I'm finding the problem of what I need to do. He says, what? In Romans chapter 7, Paul says, now you know that the law is is holy and righteous and pure, but he found out after salvation, after justification, that he had a problem with another situation that was called his sinful nature as being, as being, don't miss this, as being a Christian. Let me validate for you. Come on. Come on back with me to the book of Romans chapter 7. Come on back to me. Come with me, rather, to the book of Romans chapter 7. Paul says this, Lord have mercy, on this notion that you don't, I don't, we don't sin no more. Paul says, verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal or unspiritual. Paul says, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For I want, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, that's what I do. He says, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself that do it, but it is sin living in me. Y'all walk it with me. Here it is. Let me validate it more. Verse 18, for I know that good, I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. Y'all not talking back to me. I done lock, knock some of y'all off of your self-righteous stand that you built, that you don't sin no more. Listen, Christian disciple. You have, I have, the capacity, the propensity, the possibility as a believer to sin. Why? Because I have still in me a sinful nature. Come on, come on. Come on, safe, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, run to see what the end going to be like. You still are filled with something else. And that's a sinful nature. He doesn't lock us just in with a sinful nature. That's all we have. We have more than that since we've come to Christ. But we need to know that since we've come to Christ, don't get delusional. Like you don't do nothing no more. 
Like you don't sin no more. Can I take you to another passage? In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 10. 1 John chapter 1. You want to turn there? Come on, come on. I was going to quote it, but come on, let's turn there so, so y'all can see that what I'm quoting, what I'm saying is in the Bible. It's not a top part of my head. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Jump over verse 9, go to verse 10. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar and his word is not in us. Verse 8 says, notice singular in nature, if we claim we are Without sin, that word there means in the Greek, the capacity to sin. We claim we don't have the nature to sin. If we claim, if we say, we have not or we are without sin. He says, you are deceived and delusional. There's something wrong with you. As a Christian, to claim that you don't do nothing and you haven't did nothing and you are not doing nothing. He says you have the capacity in you. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, he says, I find that the stuff I don't want to do, I hate because I found out that I have a nature, a sinful capacity for me to sin. Are you with me here? And later on in the same chapter 7 of the book of Romans, Paul says this. He says, now shows how, how, how duplistic we are, how bipolar we are spiritually. How, y'all not talking back to me. How, how, how we suffer from dementia, spiritual dementia. He, he says, one moment, I, I really do. I, 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 I want to do what's right. And they sang it in the song too. Y'all said it in the song. Y'all didn't even know y'all said it in the song. He said, in my mind, I was strong. In my mind. But my ability, my actions was different than my attitude. Lord have mercy. I, I, I want to do right. Are you with me here? But I wind up doing wrong the thing that I hate to do, but I do the stuff that I hate, and I don't do the stuff that I love. Don't that sound like a schizophrenia, man of schizophrenia? But, but he was communicating the reality of his salvation experience after he became a believer. And then he says this, and this is where I want to hang my hat on and try to close this out. He says, every time I wanted to do good, evil judge... Or sin was right there. Now, here's the, the nuance of that verse. To the Roman believers who Paul was writing to, they knew that Paul was expressing what happens to an individual that commits murder. The way that they... Um, made that person serve time is that the person that they killed, they would tie that person, wrap that person on the person's back that did the crime. That person would have to walk with that dead person. That person would have to sleep with that dead person. That person would have to eat 
with that dead person. And as time went by, rigor mortis would start setting in. And after a while, maggots would eat the decapitating body and it would become a part of the person that was carrying the body. It became so bad that you could not distinguish the dead body connected to the living body. Can you imagine this in your mind? I, I did, I did, I did. I imagined this in my mind about that reality that was practiced back then. So you go to eat your food in the morning. And that person's arms is tied to your arms. Tied to your hand. And every time you dig in, that person's hand digs in. Every time you go to bed at night, you can only sleep on your side. Any sense of comfortability because when you rolled over, you would either roll over on that person or when you roll over, that person will roll over with you. Oh, God, Lord, have mercy. When you had to go to the bathroom, y'all not talking back to me. I don't want to go that far. But, but, but you understand the concept. It, it becomes one based on what the crime that you committed, you murdered that person, so they said they're going to make this person live with you, eat with you, sleep with you, so you can see the severity of your crime. And everything you do, that person is going to be a part of what you do. Come here, let me take my seat. My sisters and my brothers, he's saying that the sinful nature is so much a part of you that whatever you do, it is always there. If you want to do something right, but you find yourself doing something wrong, it's because of the person that's not necessarily in you in this illustration, but he's on you, with you, constantly nagging you on every action that you do. That's what he meant when he said, every time I wanted to do good, evil, that dead man is on my way, my way, always objecting what I need to do. And then he says this at the latter part of the chapter. He says, oh, such a wretched man that I am. Then he says this, and we read by it quick. Who? Somebody say who. Who shall deliver me from this body of destruction? Who? Not what, but who? And then he goes on to say, I thank God through Jesus Christ. Y'all not talking back to me. He's the one that can deliver me from this dead man that's always on my back. And this is what he does. And this is what he does. This is what he does. He does it progressively. You see, what you might not know, and I want to inform you, that when the man that murdered the man has served his time for that man being on his back, they would slowly take the man off of him. They can't snatch him off of him because they would be snatching a part of the man. And it would cause damage to the living man. So what they would do is slowly work off. That dead man that has been placed on the new man, on the living man. And so they would, I found this out, that they would either put water, water, wow, and they would warm the water up to slowly separate the dead man off of the living man. 
It was a process that took place to get that dead man off of that living man so that the living man would not be identifying with the dead man. My sisters and my brothers, you just need to know that all of us that are believers have a dead man living inside of us. It's in our veins, it's in our skin, under our skin, and he keeps interrupting our process. So God knows that he can't eradicate him or snatch him out of us. He just adds to us a new nature. And that new nature slowly constantly, consistently begins to peel the activities of the old nature that lives within us. Here's the verse. I'm done. I'm finished. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, I'll get back to it next week, being confident of this very thing. He that began a good work in you, that salvation will continue to do the work, that sanctification. He's going to keep on working on us, keep on molding us, keep on pulling away the activities of the old man. It's still there. Don't be deceived. Don't be delusional. When you do that, when you do sin, it's a hard time to get you back in the fellowship because you've been delusional and deceived that you can't sin or you shouldn't sin no more. But I declare when you receive the whole truth about sanctification, you will find that there are times that we do fall down. But guess what? We get back up. The proverb writer says the righteous man, the righteous woman falls seven times. But they get back up. And they keep on moving. Keep on pressing. Keep on doing. Keep on becoming what God desires for him or her to become. The late James Cleveland said this and I'm done. He says, if you don't see me walking right, if you don't see me talking right, he said, please be patient with me. Why? Because God is not through with me yet. I got any witnesses in here? I got anybody in here? that is sanctified anybody in here that's being sanctified say yes 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 no oh, yes hey I am sanctified, but I'm also being sanctified. I am saved, but I'm also being saved. And you should be able to look by inventory of your life that when you have, when you first came to Christ, you can mark the way you were. After some months, some years, and I'll tell you next week how God starts and does the sanctifying process, what he adds to us to help us along the sanctifying process. As years go by, you should be able to look back and see progressive sanctification taking place in your life and what God, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God is doing 
in your life. And some of you are just magnifying or looking at what you don't do no more. Or not even that, but, you know, you, you don't have actions to validate that no more. Some of us are being sanctified by our attitude. You're stinking thinking about what you think about matters. You don't judge it or put it through the microscope or the grid of Scripture on what God thinks about matters. And sometimes as a Christian, you can be in a perpetual state of carnality solely based on the way you think. That's why the Bible calls that a carnal mind. It's not just in what you do. Sometimes it's what you think. And you think that what you think is the way God thinks. And when you read scripture, you find out that my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. I'm so higher and greater. As far as the heaven is above the earth, God says, my thoughts is above your thoughts and my ways are above your ways. So sanctification for a disciple, they need to know, we need to know, you need to know that this word of justification needs to be a part of your memory and this word of sanctification needs a part needs to be a part of your spiritual vocabulary your theological library because this is what makes us more like him and less like us there may be somebody here this morning 